Presented by Caltech. It's my pleasure uh, to introduce tonight's Watson lecture speaker, Professor Monsi Kozlowal, who's an assistant professor of astronomy here at Caltech. I'm Fiona Harrison. I'm the chair of the division of uh, physics, mathematics, and astronomy. So Monsi is one of Caltech's astronomy's own products. She received her PhD here in 2011. And in fact, I was on her thesis committee. Uh, during the period when she was a graduate student, she discovered whole new kinds of explosive events, which she found by monitoring the sky for things that go bump in the night. And she called these new kinds of uh, explosions by the somewhat mundane name of gap transients because they filled a gap between the very luminous explosions called supernovae and the much less, thousand times less luminous events called novae. And I have to say, since then, I'm very happy to say she's become much more creative in her terminology for her new discovered transients. And she'll tell you a bit about that tonight. Uh, at this time, when Monsi was a graduate student, we all knew she was going places. But I have to say, at that time, I can't say that I imagined that I would be the division chair in introducing her at her first Watson lecture. So after she finished at Caltech, uh, she went on to become a prize postdoctoral fellow at uh, Carnegie and Princeton, and then joined us on the faculty in 2015. Uh, if I had to think, I was trying to think in the introduction of, of a single phrase that kind of captures the work that Monsi has done uh, since she's come to Caltech. And the phrase I came up, came up with was big things with little telescopes. So she's developed a very exciting program using the 48 inch Samuel Ocean Telescope and her newest Gattini Telescope, both on Mount Palomar, to search for all kinds of interesting phenomena that flicker, vary, and explode. This is one of the newest and most exciting areas in modern astronomy and Monsi has received numerous awards for her work in it. This includes giving the 2020 Eddington Prize Lecture of Cambridge University and the Royal Astronomical Society and receiving the prestigious Packard Fellowship, which generously uh, supported her work with Gattini. So I'm very pleased now to turn over the computer screen to Monsi Koslowal, who's gonna tell us about what cosmic fireworks unveil about the universe. A very good afternoon to all of you. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to share some of my excitement about a beautiful universe with you today. I hope all of you are staying safe and healthy, and I'm very grateful for this opportunity to, to talk to you today. Our universe is a dynamic place. It is anything but unchanging. Every second, somewhere in the universe, there's a supernova. And these brilliant but ephemeral, sh very short-lived flashes of light are what synthesize the building blocks of our universe. In the animation that you see playing, um, you see two neutron stars spiraling towards each other, merging, forming a black hole, launching an ultra-relativistic jet, having a cocoon breakout, and synthesizing half the elements in the periodic table heavier than iron. I'll tell you much more about this in the lecture, but before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge these beautiful smiling faces. These are my students and postdocs, and by far the biggest pleasure and privilege of being a faculty member at Caltech is having the opportunity to mentor such a fantastic group of students and postdocs. I will credit their contributions throughout the talk as well. So the way I've organized the Watson Lecture today is to answer three questions. First of all, how do we discover cosmic fireworks? What are the tools, the technology, the telescopes, the instruments that we need? After we discover them, how do we characterize them? How do we find out that multi-wavelength data that we need to understand the physics of these transients? 
And then I'll spend most of the talk actually on part three, which is after the discovery and characterization, what do we learn from these cosmic fireworks? What mysteries of the universe do they unlock for us? So now I'd like to take you for discovery 130 miles southeast of Pasadena to Palomar Observatory. This beautiful mountaintop is not too far from us and, and you can see the centerpiece is the venerable 200 inch Hale Telescope. And, and not just the Hale Telescope, but all the telescopes on the mountain live the legacy of Professor George Ellery Hale. His motto for us was to make no small plans and dream no small dreams. And these small telescopes that surround Palomar Observatory are, are living the dream of what I like to call celestial cinematography. So here, we not only take images of the sky, but we try to make a movie of the sky, night after night, hour after hour, in fact, and we look for things that change, look for those flashes of light that I call cosmic fireworks. So I'll take you inside two domes today. The first dome I'll take you inside is the Samuel Austin 48-inch telescope dome that houses the Zwicky Transient Facility, named after Professor Fritz Zwicky. And then I'll take you inside uh, a little clamshell dome, uh, which houses the Palomar Gatini IR project. So let's begin with the Zwicky Transient Facility. Now, Professor Fritz Zwicky um, had a pioneering legacy at Caltech of founding time domain astronomy, as we know it today. He discovered supernovae using photographic plates at the back of a Schmidt telescope. Now today, thanks to Moore's law and advances in CCD technology, we have these wafer scale devices. You see 16 of them in the picture here. And these wafer scale devices is silicon the size of a photographic plate, which means we have the technology now to map the sky at an unprecedented speed. This is the same telescope that I used for my PhD thesis. Um, now almost a decade ago, where I would stick my head inside the tube of this telescope and change the filters for the predecessor of this project, the Paloma Transient Factory. Just to give you some context of the cameras that are coming online in the past decade, um, you can see their field of view on the sky, so how big a picture they can take in one shot in this diagram here. So you can see that the moon is about half a degree on the sky. The lovely Andromeda galaxy is all but one ship for us in the Zwicky Transient Facility. So 47 square degrees is 230 full moons every 30 seconds. It takes us eight seconds to read out that data, and then we can take another picture and another picture. Every hour, we are imaging 4,000 square degrees. We run out of sky to observe in a few hours, and so we repeat again in multiple filters. Now, how do we actually find the, the cosmic fireworks in this torrent of, of a large quantity of data every night? We want to find these transients in real time. We don't want to wait till the next morning after we eat our breakfast to look at the data because these transients could fade. They could fade in minutes, they could fade in hours, and we want to learn as much as we can from those transients. So the technique that we use to process this large amount of data and completely fully automatically identify those cosmic fireworks is image subtraction. Now my little kindergartner will tell you he's mastered subtraction in kindergarten. So what's the big deal about subtraction? Uh, little does he know that his mommy had to learn subtraction all over again when she came to grad school at Caltech. So what you see here is an image on the left, the new image. Uh, this is the image of a galaxy taken tonight. We try to match this image, so under, undergo match filtering, involve the PSF, correct for weather, the cloudiness, the, the wind speed, the slight difference in the detector pixels as the, the photons hit, et cetera, a little bit more complicated. And then we match it to a reference image from say the night before. And then we subtract these two images to look, remove everything that did not change and look for that spark, that light that did change. And this brilliant firework is a supernova. And a testament to that, the fact that we've been doing this night after night in full, fully industrial scale mode is this uh, movie where you can see our uh, supernova discoveries. So as time goes on the sky, this points out to you where a supernova occurred that the Zwicky Transient Facility discovered. On the right, you see the three-dimensional rendition in, in space as well. So every red dot here is a white dwarf that got completely obliterated as a type 1a supernova. 
Every blue dot you see here is a core collapse supernova, so the death of a very massive star that's exploded as a supernova. And if you have a good eye, you'll notice some green dots hiding in there. So a supernova is when a single star or two stars become a billion times the brightness of the sun. Now, a superluminous supernova is almost tens of billions times brighter than the sun. So we found some of these very, very luminous explosions as well. And now, we've, today, we've crossed the 5,000 mark for supernovae. Now, that is all fantastic, and we are discovering not just supernovae, but also all kinds of moving objects in our solar system, all kinds of stellar variables in the Milky Way. But we are limited if we only look in visible light, i.e. the light, the part of the electromagnetic spectrum that my eyes and your eyes can see. And the reason I say that it is limiting is that there are some pieces of the universe that are hidden in visible light. So here's a picture of a little piece of our, our own galaxy. It's a dark molecular cloud that's taken in visible light. And at first blush, it seems like there's nothing there. It's just a big dark blob. Now, if you're willing to just tune the wavelength a little bit longer, move from the visible to the infrared uh, beyond a micron, then that wavelength of light is long enough that it can go around those dust particles. And voila, you can see that hidden inside this dark molecular cloud is a protostellar jet that's shooting out from both sides of this young star. Now I think you can guess what I'm going to say next. Uh, now we have the infrared and the time domain, and I want to put them together and not just take static infrared images, but make a movie of the sky in the infrared. Now that's a tad bit harder than the optical because I don't have such a nice showcase of lots of CCDs or, or big cameras in the infrared. In fact, when I came to Caltech as a faculty member in 2015, the biggest infrared camera was the Vista camera that the Europeans built, which was extremely expensive and only 0.6 square degrees. I wanted an infrared camera that was as big as ZTF, 47 square degrees. Now that requires a bit of a leap, a factor of 40 leap, that requires a little bit of inspiration to build something like Palomar Gatini IR. But Caltech, there's no dearth of inspiration. In fact, just like Caltech is a birthplace for time domain astronomy, Caltech is also a birthplace for infrared astronomy. Our own Professor Neugebauer began this field a few decades ago. So surely um, combining the time do domain with the infrared must be possible at Caltech. So we put together a few pieces and we built um, this telescope uh, called the Palomar Gatini IR telescope, which is a 30 centimeter telescope with a whopping 25 square degree field of view. And today, night after night, we are able to image 9,000 square degrees every two nights to a depth of 16th magnitude in the J-band. And we are able to make this movie of the sky and look for infrared transients, things that were hidden from us either due to dust in the Milky Way or due to self-obscuration or due to nuclear physics and bound-bound opacity. But we'll come back to that one. Now I'd like to take a moment and transition from these two discovery engines that I've told you about to characterizing these cosmic fireworks, to learning everything we can possibly learn by collecting data across the electromagnetic spectrum. There's just one problem though. Uh, Palomar is a fantastic place to discover these transients, but the Earth rotates and the sun rises. And once the sun rises, for optical and infrared astronomy, it's a showstopper, it's a party pooper. We need a way to beat sunrise so that if a transient is fading away in a few hours, we don't stop when the sun rises, but we keep going. And the way we do that is by, is by making friends with people around the, the globe and moving west. So west of Palomar, well, is the Pacific Ocean, but a little bit further west in the, in the Pacific Ocean is beautiful island of Hawaii and Caltech's WM Keck Observatory. Uh, these are the most beautiful, magnificent eyes on the sky. So we can discover transients at Palomar and then we have three more hours before the sun rises in Hawaii uh, to get data about this transient, especially spectroscopic data, which is absolutely critical to the work that we do. And then once the sun rises in Hawaii, we can move further west and go to Japan, Taiwan, uh, India, Israel, Sweden, and collect this ring of data around the world. 
And this has been possible uh, through a National Science Foundation partnership and international research and education program that Caltech leads that's called the Growth Project. The way we organize ourselves in the Growth Project is through a dynamic collaborative platform uh, where we are able to feed in the incoming streams, discovery streams like Gatini and ZTF, and we channel these in different, based on different science programs to a, a set of 37 telescopes around the world. Now, there are over 137 scientists actively using this. This is the home page. Uh, our astronomers in the growth network use this page more than Facebook. Um, and with this, we are able to make our transient discoveries, characterize them, study them in great detail, and write those scientific papers um, that are so fun to, uh, to learn more about the universe. And I'm also happy to announce the next generation of the system, uh, which is an open source Fritz code, uh, which is a collaboration between Caltech and Berkeley, has just gone live on GitHub. Now I'd like to spend the rest of the talk on the most fun question about what do we learn from cosmic fireworks after we found them. So let me begin with the life cycle of a star. So see you have this, this stellar cloud with protostars that collapses and forms stars. Most of the stars will be like our very own sun. They'll expand, become a red giant, form a planetary nebula. They'll burn hydrogen into helium, helium into carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. And then eventually they'll just form a white dwarf. Now, there are a small number of stars which are much heavier, that are more than 10 times to almost 100 times as heavy as the sun. For these more massive stars, the nuclear fusion in the core doesn't stop at at uh, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. It keeps going further and further to silicon, sulfur, to iron, and then it stops at iron because then burning is no longer efficient. You don't get um, more energy by burning these elements in the core. These more massive stars actually have much shorter lifetimes than the sun. And once they become red supergiants, they undergo something called core collapse, where the, the central part of the core co collapses and the outer layers are thrown out into a majestic supernova that's a billion times the brightness of the sun. And depending on the details, who the companion to the star was, what the environmental conditions were, et cetera, uh, it, the, that central remnant could either form a neutron star or a black hole, or there could be no remnant at all. So there could be nothing left behind. Now, just to give you a sense of how dense these objects are, the white dwarf, the neutron star, and the black hole, imagine you have a teaspoon and you could just take a scoop of that white dwarf. One little teaspoon of that white dwarf would be 10 tons, tens of tons in your hands. Extremely, extremely dense. And if that doesn't blow your mind, imagine taking that same teaspoon and scooping out that neutron star. That neutron star would be tens of million tons. So that should certainly be heavy enough for you. But if you want a singularity, but I can't even quantify how dense the object is, you can go and try to take a scoop out of a black hole. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you about some cosmic fireworks from each of these three compact objects, the white dwarfs, the neutron stars, and the black holes. So let's begin with some white dwarf fireworks. And for this, I take you back to the Gatini, Palomar Gatini IR project. And what we are seeing here are two white dwarfs that merge to form a bigger white dwarf. Now, when that happens, the animation on the right you see is actually showing, showing you how much material is just dredged out and, set, and spewed out in the infrared. So what that does to the light curve, now light curve is what you see in the four panels on the left, that is brightness as a function of time, right? So, how, so you can see these light curves, and we'll see many of these light curves in the next few slides. The, the, uh, the white dwarf merger product goes up, comes down, almost disappears for a few hundred days, then comes back up. So these are what my graduate student uh, Viraj describes as roller coaster light curves. And what we are seeing is activity the, uh, of the material that's being dredged up by these R core Bohr stars. And the, the Palomar Gatini IR survey is undertaking a full census of these and has already found 149 compelling candidates that could be likely white dwarf merger products. Now, sometimes white dwarfs are not just not so well behaved, they get a bit greedy, and they start stealing material from their companion. And when that happens, you saw there could be an explosion. 
So if too much material is stolen, then the white dwarf will no longer be able to balance the electron degeneracy with gravity. So these two forces that are nicely f balanced inside the white dwarf, and it could explode and form a type 1a supernova. If just a little bit of material is stolen, then you could have some burning on the surface of the white dwarf that's not supernova, but a classical nova. So it's about a million times as bright, as bright as the sun, and it could happen over and over again. So let's look at these classical nova explosions. We've been seeing a lot of them lately with the Palomar Gattini IR telescope. Now here we are playing the same game that we do with ZTF, which is that we do image subtraction and learn subtraction, but a little bit more tricky than ZTF because we have a coarser spatial res res resolution. We have to give up spatial resolution for that large field of view, but even in regions as dense as our galactic plane, you can see our image triplets, new minus reference equals subtraction, and on that subtraction image, you see this bright star, and that is the NOVA discovery. On the right panel, you see light curves, brightness as a function of time. And you'll see that while these transients are very bright in the infrared, uh, they are almost a factor of 100 times fainter in the optical. So they are hidden inside our, deep inside our galaxy. And that's why that we have been able to more than double the discovery rate of Novi by putting these infrared eyes on the universe. So you could ask this question, why? Why are they so hidden or why are they so buried? Where in our galaxy are they? So this here is a picture of our galaxy. The plane of the galaxy is in the middle. The darker regions is where most of the mass, most of the stars are. That yellow piece, this one in the middle, is that southern quadrant that we can't see because it's directly below us. So Palomar can see three quarters, three pi of the sky, but not that one quarter that is directly below us. So in that rest of the northern sky, uh, you can see the galactic plane in the middle and you can see above and below the plane. And if you plot on these, the novae that have been discovered in the past many decades, they are shown by these blue dots here. So they're all over, mostly off the plane, not much where the stars are. Now, interestingly, with Gatini, our novae, which are denoted by these colored stars, are right in the plane of the galaxy. They're right where those stars are. And this should be no surprise. In fact, um, NOVA guru Bob Williams um, noted that he's often wondered where these classical NOVA are, right? Um, and, his, and the answer is they're just extinct. They're just hidden in the dust of our own galaxy. So we are able to convert this picture now to tell us what this distribution of NOVA is. So previous works in the optical have shown that the distribution of NOVA as a function of uh, on the x-axis how hidden they are, looks like this gray line. With Gatini, well, there's many more that are hidden that we are finding. And so if you com combine all of this information together, you're able to come up with an answer of what the rate of classical novae are. And our conclusion was that this is 46 plus or minus 13 per year. And there's just so much excitement in the NOVA community because there's a, this is a systematic survey which could actually measure that extinction distribution and get that number for a rate. So now I'd like to move on from white dwarfs, dial up the density by a factor of, uh, of 10 million and talk about neutron stars. But before I go into that, I have to share a story. I'm standing here on, on the stage of Beckman Auditorium. I've only had this opportunity to do this once before, almost exactly five years ago. And at that time, we, had, we were celebrating a Ripples in Space Time event where we were celebrating the discovery of gravitational waves, which happened just two weeks after I walked into Caltech as, as a faculty member. And there were these discoveries of two very massive black holes that had merged that had lit up the gravitational wave detectors. So at that time on stage were Professor Kip Thorne, Professor Barry Barish, Professor Alan Weinstein, Professor Rana Adhikari, all these amazing physicists who had actually made the discovery of gravitational waves happen after decades and decades of hard work. I was also on stage and I had five minutes and I'll tell you why, because I just wanted to share a crazy dream. 
At that time, on February of 2016, the dream I wanted to share was that one day we will not only have gravitational waves, but we will also be able to see the light associated with the gravitational waves. So to be able to see light and gravitational waves from the same source, we were preparing to do these searches and waiting for, uh, for not just two black holes to merge, but for two neutron stars to merge. Now Caltech is a place where you're allowed to say crazy dreams, you're allowed to share these crazy dreams, but I did not know that only a year and a half later, on August 17th, 2017, at 12.41.04 UTC, my life would change. On this, in this moment, two neutron stars decided to, to spiral into each other and merge to form a black hole. LIGO Hanford, LIGO Livingston saw this beautiful long chirp. So instead of this few seconds that they, they usually see when two massive black holes merge, since it was much lighter, it was two neutron stars merging, they got to see a very loud, very long waveform for nearly 100 seconds here. This was the perfect opportunity to look for um, an electromagnetic counterpart. So my, my, uh, my computers are set up to wake everybody up in the growth team. Our cell phones quite literally ring and wake us up. But usually that was all the training that we had done was with the binary black hole mergers. This was the first time that my computer was telling me that this could be two neutron stars. So we sprung into action. And we didn't have to wait very long because just 1.7 seconds later, the Fermi satellite and the integral satellite had detected a burst of gamma rays. Gamma rays are the most energetic photons in the electromagnetic spectrum. And they had seen a two second burst, nearly two seconds later, of, of these two neutron stars merging. Now, they didn't know where it came from. The localization is pretty poor in space for both gamma rays and gravitational waves. But the chance coincidence of two things happening so close in time suggested that maybe we were seeing light and gravitational waves from the same source. So we got even more excited to now try to find out the exact home of the merger. So we took these rough sky positions, which was just like, okay, it happened somewhere there in those 30 square degrees. Inside that, there were 45 galaxies that could, any one of them could be the home of the merger. We, so we started imaging them in the optical and the infrared. In this case, Chile was the best place to image them. And we found that there was one galaxy out of them, NGC 4993, that hosted this remarkable transient that was the true light from the, from the, uh, from the gravitational wave event. We had found light from gravitational waves. Now, once the coordinates were announced, and they were first announced by the Henrietta Swope Telescope at Las Campanas Observatory, an entire global effort started to collect more data about these events. There, everybody with a telescope, literally, something like 77 telescopes were involved. And you can see that as the night sets, different telescopes are collecting data, they're getting lit up. You'll see there's some green telescopes that are able to collect data even during the day. These are our radio telescopes that don't get bothered with, even with the sun, when the sun is up. And there were seven telescopes in space that were also collecting data. So for a few weeks, we had the most majestic data set of any electromagnetic transient to date to understand and study and characterize what we had just found. For those three weeks, we didn't, we didn't sleep. <laughs> In the same three weeks, the growth team decided that sleep was totally not important, and we were gonna to put together all these beautiful clues that we'd collected into three papers. Professor Greg Hallinan led the discovery of the radio uh, the paper, and uh, in, in, a, in the second paper, uh, the ultraviolet and the X-ray data, uh, Professor Fiona Harrison and Caltech alum Brad Senko put the firepower of the SWIFT and New Star teams. So we had the radio, the X-ray, and the UV covered. My paper, we presented the optical and infrared data, and we tried to synthesize all the clues together into a, into a single concordant picture. So let me tell you more about this, the scientific questions we could address. The first question was something that was asked decades ago, which was, are neutron star mergers indeed the long sought sites of our process nuclear synthesis? Let me explain that um, uh, piece by piece. So if you look at the periodic table, um, you see that most of the universe is very boring. It's just hydrogen and helium formed during Big Bang nucleosynthesis. All the elements that you see in blue are those synthesized by massive stars or supernovae of different flavors. That's what the light blue and the, and the dark blue is. 
And so you can get that from supernova explosions, of which we know thousands of examples now. But before August 17, 2017, we had no idea where half the elements in the periodic table, the elements shown in yellow, how they are formed, where they are formed. We had theoretical ideas, but seeing is believing. And August 17, 2017 was, was the first time we were able to see this and catch this being formed red-handed. Now the challenge with these very heavy elements is that in order to make these very heavy nuclei, you need to undergo what's called in chemistry the R process. R stands for rapid capture of free neutrons. So when you're trying to rapidly capture these free neutrons uh, and you're growing your nuclei bigger and bigger, the problem is that um, the electrons have many, many possible line transitions that they could go to. They could go in the S shell, the P shell, the D shell, the F shell. There are many possible line transitions. So if a photon that's trying to escape and come and get, get captured on your telescope, that photon can, can get um, distracted or sidetracked by these electrons jumping around. So this is what we call in nuclear physics bound-bound opacity. The emission is very opaque, and the peak of the emission gets shifted out of the optical bands and peaks in the infrared bands. So we need to look for something that's very red to be able to see the signature of these heavy elements being formed. Now our data in this case, the light curve again, brightness, as a function of time, looked like this. So you can see that the bluer bands shown in the bottom they fade away in a few hours. The ultraviolet bands, it's just a few hours and they're gone. The optical fades away in a few days. The infrared is sustained for a few weeks. So we had found a transient that was surprisingly bright and blue at early time, but had very rapidly reddened. And this rapid reddening was further confirmed with spectroscopy. And this here is a beautiful sequence taken by the VLT telescope in Chile, where you can see a really hot blue thing. And you can see it as time goes, it's becoming redder and redder. And it's full of these big bumps and wiggles in the spectrum, which are telling you which elements formed. And it's quite complicated because there's so many elements that were synthesized and they're all moving at such high speeds that the lines are getting mushed together, blended together in these big, broad features. So, Everybody, all the teams, everyone agrees that there's no question that heavy elements were synthesized in, in these two neutron star mergers. The debate is which one of these heavy elements was made and how much of it and how similar or different is it to the heavy elements that we see in our own solar neighborhood, right? So if you plot atomic mass number between 80 and 200 or so, you can see the different uh, solar abundance peaks. And you can ask the question, were the heaviest of the heavy elements formed. Now, um, one of the ele or two elements that you may be interested in are elements with atomic mass 195 and 197. Some of you may recognize this to be gold and platinum. They're very precious elements. There's only a little bit of them um, on Earth. And, but they're extremely heavy. Um, and the question, even though we see all of these heavy elements form, the question is, do we see the heaviest of the heavy elements, like gold and platinum and neodymium and other, other lanthanides. And one way to, to test that question is to wait a little bit. Because in that first month, you see in the green line on the right, the emission, the light is dominated by the lighter of the heavy elements. And then you see that green line just crash. And then the yellow line, the red line, the purple line, they dominate after a month from the merger. Now the catch was that uh, GW170817, this majestic event, occurred uh, very close to the sun. So in a few weeks, it was not accessible anymore by all but, but one telescope. And this was NASA's great observatory, the Spitzer Space Telescope. And um, the Spitzer Space Telescope, thanks to uh, Professor Tom Seufer, agreed to observe this event um, at the very, very late phase of 43 days and 74 days after merger, and do a, take a deep image at four and a half microns, a very red, very late image, to try and look for the signature of the heaviest of the heavy elements. And voila, you know, much to our surprise, because it's a very difficult observation inside this very bright galaxy, we were able to identify emission from GW170817 in these Spitzer image images. So that's a tantalizing clue that we have, that we did strike gold. In fact, if you take the time scales, the luminosities, the evolution, you can go one step further and see it's possibly these eight elements that I've circled in red here that are likely responsible for that late time red emission. 
And when the James Webb telescope is launched, we should be able to test this hypothesis of whether it was these eight elements that were synthesized and dominating at this late phase. Let me now uh, change gears and talk a little bit about uh, jet physics. So, so far I've focused on the middle of the electromagnetic spectrum, right? The ultraviolet, the optical, the infrared. Let me tell you what we learned from the extremes, the gamma rays, the X-rays, and the radio here. And here the question that I want you to think about is, are neutron star mergers progenitors of short hard gamma ray bursts? So here the question is, me being very careful about whether we call it a gamma ray burst or a burst of gamma rays. Because even though we saw this two second burst, I showed you that, that image two seconds later, there was something very peculiar about it. It had happened in our backyard. The galaxy was only 40 megaparsec away, but it was very, very weak. It was for, it, almost a factor of 10,000 times weaker than any other gamma ray burst we had seen. So if we were looking down the barrel of the jet, then the fact that this burst is so weak would make it very difficult to even break out and if or even to, if order to exist given this low luminosity. So the idea that we were looking down the barrel of the jet was, very, was not seeming very likely. So it was proposed that maybe, it, maybe we were looking slightly off axis. So most of the, the jet was going this way and maybe you know, an alien planet that was located at this position could see a much more powerful jet, but because we were 0.1 radians off, we were seeing something that was much wimpier. That's okay, that's plausible, but the problem is that if, if we were only 0.1 radians off, which is what we have to be to explain the gamma rays, we can't explain the X-rays and radio, because the X-ray and radio emission, my colleague professor and friend, Professor Greg Hallinan, had to wait for nine days before the X-rays and the radio lit up which me meant that we were very, very widely off axis. Now, so far, all our telescopes are on the same planet Earth, um, we, so we can't have two different lines of sight to the same event, it's just not possible. So something is wrong, the standard picture is just not working. So these two surprises, right, about the, the intensity of the gamma rays being very weak, and the long delay and the long wait um, for the radio and X-ray emission to light up, uh, suggested that something else was at play. So we suggested in this concordant picture that what we were seeing was the breakout of a cocoon. So on the left, you see the energetics. On the right, you see the kinematics. Let me explain this picture a little bit. So as those two neutron stars were going round and round each other and th stealing and uh, throwing out a lot of material, a lot of tidally dripped material was, was thrown out, the jet that, that got launched when the black hole was born gets stuck. It's not being launched into a very clean environment. It's being launched into a very messy environment. And in this messy environment, the energy from the jet starts to get transferred to all this material, all the stuff around it. So instead of this clean, narrow, ultra relativistic jet, you get this wide angle, mildly relativistic cocoon. And when I say mild, let me clarify, because mild is not very mild, it's still 0.99 times the speed of light, but it's mild compared to a narrow jet normally seen in a gamma ray burst, which is 0.999995 uh, the speed of light. So this mildly relativistic jet, because it's mild, gives you gamma ray emission that's intrinsically weaker. Because it's slower, it gives you this delay in the X-ray and the radio emission. It also explains why you see this bright blue emission at early time, when all the R process material should just give you a lot of very red emission at later time. So the pieces of the puzzle se seem to be holding together. And the big question when we wrote that first set of papers was what was the fate of the jet? And if this cocoon model was correct, then the question is, did the jet get completely choked by the co cocoon? Or did the jet also manage to break out such that you had both a jet and a cocoon. Uh, we also made the prediction that if this cocoon is actually the right model, then the radio emission, even though it was this long excruciating wait to see those radio photons, it'll keep going. It'll keep rising for a few hundred days. And that's just what happened. The radio emission kept rising for a few hundred days and then it crashed. And that crash and the VLBI images before and after were able to infer that the jet did survive. The jet was very narrow, very hard, but it did survive. So the picture on the right is actually the right one. 
So, so we had a cocoon and the jet had survived. So that was a lot of fun um, with neutron stars. Uh, now I'd like to talk a little bit about black hole fireworks. So um, with black hole fireworks, so far we've talked about two black holes merging. That was the Nobel Prize winning discovery. We talked about two neutron stars merging and forming a black hole. What if I take one of each? We take one neutron star, one black hole, we spiral them together and we try to make them merge. This was a completely theoretical idea. We have no astronomically discovered neutron star black hole merger systems. At least for two neutron stars, we had the double pulsar, et cetera. So we knew that two neutron stars can pair up, but we didn't, don't, didn't know whether neutron star black holes can, can pair up. At least not until LIGO Virgo's third gravitational observing run, when on April 26th of 2019, a year and a half ago, um, there was, once again, my cell phone rang, and this time, instead of saying it was two black holes or two neutron stars, it decided to say that the alert said that it was a neutron star black hole. That was a, not the highest signal-to-noise uh, event that um, the LIGO Virgo collaboration had detected. It was very coarsely localized. I mean, 30 square degrees is bad, but this was several thousand square degrees. You see this long banana on the sky. So it was, but we wanted to look for the electromagnetic counterpart, if it existed. And thankfully, I had a brave graduate student and the wonderful growth collaboration. Um, this alert came, unfortunately, at 8.30 in the morning. Um, we were just finishing up, actually, a search for a binary neutron star event, and we were observing with the uh, beautiful WM Keck Observatory at this time. Um, so first, we skipped a heartbeat. We, we just froze dead in our tracks. But a second later, we, we sprung into action. It was daytime in California, but nighttime in India. So our, our relay race began in India with the Growth India Telescope, then in Chile with the Dark Energy Camera, and then with Palomar at, uh, with Palomar Gatini IR and ZTF. So we looked, but we didn't find anything. Um, so we took a pause, and we waited for the next neutron star black hole merger event. We didn't have to wait very long because on August 14th, 2019, there was a, a, an even higher significance, a very loud signal in the gravitational wave interferometers. This time they said it was more than 99% sure that it was a neutron star black hole merger. And for this event, they had a very nice localization in the Southern Hemisphere. So the two Caltech postdocs, Igor and Danny, shown here, uh, undertook some beautiful analysis of the dark energy camera data with, um, on a four-meter telescope in Chile. And they imaged this region multiple times, multiple nights, in the reddest possible filters. And they looked at the data forwards and backwards and sideways, whichever way you possibly could, but it didn't find an electromagnetic counterpart. If there was an event like GW170817, there's just no way we could miss it in the data. So our conclusion was, there is no electromagnetic counterpart to this event. Now, we didn't know much about the gravitational wave properties at that time. The data was still being analyzed. But there was something that was suggesting the lack of a counterpart, um, which was, by the way, confirmed by an independent analysis by a team in Chicago, the DESGW team, that there was just nothing there, right? So maybe the neutron star got swallowed whole by the black hole. That could happen, particularly if the mass ratio is too large. Like suppose that the neutron star is, is two solar masses and the black hole is 20 solar masses. Then it could just take one, in one fell swoop, it could just swallow the, the neutron star whole. There's no time for any material to get thrown out um, that, could, that, would, that could give us photons. It also depends on the spin of the black hole, the tidal deformability of the neutron star, etc. cetera. So the, but there are pieces of that phase space, right? You see there are some black diagrams in here where you don't see an electromagnetic counterpart. But then you see these lighter regions where you do expect to see one. So what we learned was that, OK, we should not be too disappointed by these first two that we did not see anything in, but we should keep looking and look for a red source that rapidly reddens. So um, in fact, theoretically, Professor Dan Kaysen at UC Berkeley wrote this beautiful paper where he shows that the infrared is actually ubiquitous. It's super luminous and very long-lived, even in the case of a neutron star black hole merger. It is very robust, sort of independent of these mass ratio problems, the line of sight problems, how, how much time it takes that remnant to collapse to form a black hole if it's too quick, too, too slow, et cetera. So I was very motivated to build a red, um, even more sensitive infrared mapper. 
So I was working with my collaborator, Professor Rob Simcoe at MIT, who knew a way of making Gatini even more sensitive. And that was by leveraging alternative semiconductor technology. So far in astronomy, we traditionally use mercury cadmium telluride detectors, but in Professor Simcoe's lab, he had been testing these indium gallium arsenide detectors, which are cheaper by a factor of five per pixel, which means you can afford these large, large focal planes. And what he found was that they were somewhat noisier, but the noise budget is dominated by the sky. So it doesn't matter because it's a small fraction of a much larger noise budget. So uh, we applied to the National Science Foundation, and we are now um, very happy to report that we are building this new uh, next generation infrared surveyor called Winter, which is a one square degree camera on a one meter telescope at Palomar Observatory. And my friends in Australia, who I partnered with for Gatini, also secured funding from the Australian Research Council uh, to build a sister project in Siding Springs called Dreams. So Winter and Dreams, um, we are hoping for first light later this year, later in 2021. And we hope to be ready for LIGO Virgo's fourth gravitational wave observing run to look for that neutron star black hole merger counterpart. So I'd like to take a moment to look ahead before we wrap up here. So looking ahead, um, I've been told that, uh, that giving this Watson lecture is, you know, most, for most faculty members at Caltech, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity, except for Kip Thorne. I think that's an exception. So I thought I'll take the last few minutes here, just um, having some fun and, and, um, and sh telling you about my, my dreams in, in the coming decade um, here. So this year, later this year, this is, this is not a dream, this is reality, right? Winter and dreams will come online and we'll have a fighting chance to find that neutron star black hole merger counterpart. Now who knows how elusive the universe is going to be and how bright or faint or red that counterpart is going to be. So might as well start dreaming about how to crank up that sensitivity, not by one order of magnitude, but by two orders of magnitude. So for that, I'd like to take you to Antarctica for the last few minutes. And you may ask why Antarctica <laughs> of all places, it's pretty cold down there. Um, the reason I'd like you to take, take you to Antarctica is that there's something very special about um, the, the polar regions. And that is that the night sky, which was the dominant thing in the noise budget, as I just mentioned for infrared observations, there's a piece of the night sky, in fact, at 2.35 micron to be specific, where the night sky is nearly a factor of 40 times darker. So this is a signal to noise problem. Either you boost your signal or you suppress your noise, you win both ways. And in this case, we are trying to suppress that noise from the sky by a factor of 40. Moreover, the seeing is fantastic. And by seeing, I mean, how tight is that point spread function? So at Palomar, we are happy when the seeing is, is better than an arc second, um, which is how small the star is on the detector. At, um, at Dome C in particular, as long as you can go to a few meters off the ground, you can get quarter arc second seeing. So there's a huge opportunity to increase your sensitivity if you're able to deploy an infrared surveyor in the Antarctic. But there are two technology challenges. The first one is detectors. In, in indium gallium arsenide is fantastic, but currently cuts off at 1.7 micron, and I needed to work at 2.35 micron. Um, but thankfully, Professor Don Feiger has an idea for that, and that is MBE on silicon. And he's, as we speak, um, he's waiting for a new batch of detectors to try to see if the quantum efficiency of them can, can peak at 2.35 microns, and if they could be a viable path forward. The other challenge is, of course, thermal noise um, it's, uh, and how to work around that. But Roger Smith, who's a senior engineer at Caltech in the Caltech Optical Observatories, um, has just won a project to, to test out this very creative, fully cryogenic telescope plus instrument design. So not only the instrument is cold, but the entire tube of the telescope is also very cold. And we think this would work very well for our Antarctic concept. So stay tuned, um, uh, we might have a path to make this, this Antarctica vision real. And while we, while we work on that, um, NASA is giving us some, some fun gifts as well. Um, on October 31st, 2021, NASA has promised to launch the James Webb Space Telescope. And the, it's an exquisite infrared spectrograph that would be just fantastic for characterizing infrared transients that we discover by Gatini Winter Dreams, Antarctic concept, anything. 
Um, it would be fantastic to study electromagnetic counterparts, multi-messenger events. And we're already getting our foot in the door a little bit in my, my poster. Ryan Lau has an early release science uh, program for this to study this, this massive star binary. And we're starting to really um, dip our feet into, into using this, this magnificent machine that NASA is about to launch. NASA has also recently approved um, and entered phase C for the Roman Space Telescope in honor of Dr. Nancy Grace Roman. Um, and this would be a quarter square degree infrared telescope that gets launched somewhere in the mid 2020s. So this is another piece of exciting news from NASA. And this would be a lovely complement to the Antarctic concept, which is a wider field. This would be narrower and deeper. So it would be very complementary. So on that uh, note of future promise, I would like to thank you all very much for your time and attention. And I'm very happy to take questions. <laughs>